Um, first, we're going to hear from um, Sabre Kais from Purdue University on quantum machine learning for complex chemical systems. Sabre, whenever you're ready, feel free. Yeah, yeah. can you see my slides? We yeah. can. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie. And I would like to start by thanking David and Christian for this wonderful workshop. And thank you all for tuning to this talk. So I, I'm going to focus on quantum machine learning for uh, complex chemical systems. And before doing that, I would like just to give uh, motivation. I mean, why, why quantum machine learning? And in, in our research, we are focusing on quantum information and quantum computing for complex systems. And when we talk about quantum information and quantum computing, really we're trying to take advantage of the superposition, coherence, and entanglement in designing quantum algorithms to be run on a quantum computer. So now I will focus on electronic structure, but we're also interested in quantum dynamics. And since we are in a field that everything interacts with the environment, we also have to worry about open dynamics on a quantum computer. So what is the main issue here? And I'm focusing here on the wave function for this complex many body system. So the wave function contains all information about the system as we heard for the last two days. <laughs> With exponential complexity as the system size increase, when increase the size of the system, I mean, all of us are familiar with this problem. You have exponential scaling with the difficulty of treating this problem. So what, what, what is the challenge? The challenge is how to describe the non-trivial correlation encoded in the exponential complexity of this many-body wave function. But at the same time, it's really, uh, when you look at this and, and the physical system, it's hard to believe that this physical system really explored the whole Hilbert space. So somehow, there is a subspace in this Hilbert space that describes the most important information about the system. And here I summarize it. The wave function representing many body physical systems can be characterized by an amount of information much smaller than the maximum capacity of the corresponding Hilbert space. And the question is, how do we go about discovering this subspace in the full Hilbert space that's so important to get the accurate description of the system. And we thought maybe with the quantum machine learning, we can really have an approach for discovering what this is the subspace. Because if you look at machine learning, they start with large data space and they try to compress it in a way that you can handle it with different uh, models. So now just to clarify, when I said quantum machine learning, what do I mean by that? We are going to combine classical machine learning with quantum algorithms. So sometimes also people running classical algorithm for quantum system and they call it quantum machine learning. So here we really means that we have to quantize the classical machine learning model and by quantum algorithms and then run it on a quantum computer. Did we achieve this one? Did we solve the problem? No. Uh, but I think we made progress toward this goal to discover what is the subspace in Hilbert space that most important to describe the system. So the outline, I, <clears throat> sorry, I will start with a, like a just brief overview of electronic structure calculation as like a focus in my group before we start doing quantum machine learning. And then we'll focus on the restricted Boltzmann machine as a model for this quantum machine learning algorithm. And then we'll show some results for simple system, like this simple system that we use it in many applications, a quantum computer like H2, lithium hydride. And then we'll show a band structure for simple uh, model Hamiltonian for graphene and two-dimensional materials, getting both the valence and the conduction bands. And then I will show how this approach is really powerful. We can also treat quantum phase transition on a quantum computer. And then talk about future work, how quantum machine learning can be integrated in open quantum dynamics. 
So now when we talk about electronic structure on a quantum computer, there is a three different categories or three maybe approaches. The one approach which was the early approach for this problem was using the gate model. And the gate model we have calculation on using the phase estimation algorithm. And then many, many algorithms were devised to do electronic structure like direct methods. And recently we start seeing the hybrid, the classical and the quantum algorithms. But the, but the whole idea is that once you construct this unitary matrix, you decompose it into gates and you run it on a quantum computer. And I will show you, it's not, we can do it both in qubit space and qubit space where we have d-dimensional space. The other model is the adiabatic. You start with the Hamiltonian or the system that you know the answer or you know how to put it in a quantum computer. And then you deform the system slowly enough not to jump to the excited states. So you stay by the adiabatic theorem in the ground state but you do it in a way that at the end of the process, you encode the solution of the new problem that you are interested in. And the third approach is the quantum machine learning that I will focus on today. <clears throat> so just briefly, the quantum phase estimation algorithm was introduced back in the 90s, 95 by KTF, and then Seth Loy put, the, put, together, put together in a physical review letter, the details of the algorithm. And the algorithm is simply given a unitary matrix, which has a dimension D by D. And the idea is to get the phase shift, which means for us, if I put here the Hamiltonian, then in the spectrum. So for given you, you get the eigenvalues and eigenvector. And for us, when we, look at the propagator, then this is the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. And they have two registers, one for giving the accurate description of the energy and the other one for the eigenvector. And essentially what we do in this one is really a quantum Fourier transform. And then you do the inverse and you do the measurement. So back in 2005, Alan was the first to use it in getting the spectrum for H2. At the same time, I have my student was doing PhD with me, Hefeng Wang. We also trying to run these uh, ab initio methods and quantum computer and we did it for the water molecules and this was published back in physical chemistry, chemical physics. And then in 2011, I mean, we did not call it hybrid, but this is what we did. We parameterized the quantum circuit with uh, where the rotational angles of the quantum gates can be obtained. Now we are using it to, uh, we obtain by minimizing the energy in the variation in the quantum uh, variational process. But at that time we tried to get it by uh, minimizing the distance between your unitary matrix and the exact one. So it was a different process, but at the end we optimize the, the quantum the angles in the quantum gas in order to uh, get the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So this is not our discussion, it's just like a brief is that people are using quantum phase estimation. This is was really the main algorithm. And we have so far theoretical and experimental results from two to 12 qubits implemented in all the platforms, starting from D-wave, NMR, optical, trapped ion, superconductor qubits. And the main issue with, the, with this algorithms, I mean, it's an exact, it's like doing CI, but the number of gates necessary to do the calculation within the coherence of the machine is really large. So this is why we see results only for small system with the phase estimation. Then people start saying, okay, what is next? I mean, I have this machine, 50 to 100 qubits. What can we do now until we discover the quantum error correction codes and do fault tolerant quantum computing? So as I mentioned, there are a couple of directions. Do you hybrid classically quantum or adiabatic quantum computer algorithms? Quantum machine learning, which is the, <clears throat> the focus of my talk, or do calculation in the QDIT space or programming a quantum simulator where you map the system into, for example, 
many physical systems that can be like in the in the ion trap or in the optical lattices and do the simulations. Just briefly also, we generalize the quantum phase estimation algorithm to the Q did space instead of qubit. And in collaboration with the experimental group, the quantum optics group here at Purdue and the, NG, the ECA, Andrew Weiner, they were able to show that this is really can be done and we got experimental results. And for those who feel interested, we put together an, uh, a review article, QDITS and high dimensional quantum computing, which talks about how to generalize the phase estimation algorithm to QDIT space and what can we do in the QDIT space. So let's get back. And yes, but one more thing I would like to mention before quantum machine learning. We thought this is really a transformation between the Schrodinger equation and Ising where the two fields looks like separate. When we teach statistical mechanics, we use the Ising. We teach quantum mechanics, we use different models. But we, like when you map your system to the qubit space, and there is this transformation, and the details of the transformation, uh, we put it back in general physical, physical chemistry V, show how one can connect the Schrodinger equation to the, uh, uh, the Ising type Hamiltonian by increasing the dimensionality of the physical space. Although the transformation is not efficient and it's not polynomial, but this is what's exciting for us to connect the structure or the phase transition in Isaac type Hamiltonian with one we say symmetry breaking or, or critical phenomena in electronic structure calculations. And maybe over 10 years ago, we argue that quantum processes like ionization when the electron leaves the atom or the system is dissociate, there is a beautiful critical phenomena behind this process. And we discuss it, and maybe I'll come back to this at the end to connect it with the quantum phase transitions if we have time. So quantum machine learning, I mean, first classical machine learning, I mean, it's every, everywhere <laughs> successful in so many fields. You look around, you have solar farm optimization, drug discovery, grid, st grid stability finance, self-driving cars, and so on. So the field, if you look at classical machine learning, is a great success by compressing the data. And this is why we thought maybe do this uh, trick of going to the quantized version and see if we can discover the space where the wave function or the configurations that uh, needed to describe the complexity of the wave function can be done by machine learning. Again, classical machine learning used in chemistry in so many different fields. And when we talk about classical machine learning, there are three different categories. Supervised learning, where you label the data. Unsupervised learning, where you try to predict correlation with unlabeled data. And reinforcement, where you have a feedback to the system. And it used in, in first transition, imaging, drug discovery, I mean, material design, finding quantum states, and people use it also to find good functional in DFT and optimize outcome in chemical reactions. So it's used successfully in many, many areas of chemistry or in physics. So this is classical machine learning. So I'm going to combine it <clears throat> with the quantum algorithms and talk about the quantum machine learning. And again, the goal is to quantize the classical machine learning algorithms and run it on a quantum computer. So our inspiring work in this direction was the really this excellent paper by Troyer and uh, Carlo in physics back in 2017 where well, they talked about using the Bos restricted Boltzmann machine, and I will explain the details of this, to get the wave function, and they show how one can get it for the Ising Hamiltonian and the Heisberg Hamiltonian in one and two dimension. So what we did, we generalize it, because here the wave function is, they look at the amplitude. So the wave function was here is a, a they didn't, focus on the phase. So we generalize it by adding the phase to the wave function and implemented by quantum circuit on a quantum computer. 
So I thought this is really a beautiful, beautiful way to combine three successful subfields that we teach and uh, we have here at Purdue, maybe I will mention this class before I start. We have a, we have a beautiful lectures by Spiro Data on the fundamentals of the three fields. And this is recorded in the NanoHub. He called it the physics to compute. So we have Boltzmann as a model. And I, I, maybe here one point, because in machine learning, the, the really the big thing is to, I mean, to decide what is the model that you'd like to use to train your data. And for me, I mean, really, we have to rely on the physical model, what we know the physics, because at the end, it's not enough to get numerical numbers. We have to understand what the machine is doing. So relying on a model from physics or statistical physics is extremely important for our progress in this direction. And again, we have the neural network and the success in so many areas, and, uh, and all of us are really witnessing the success of the neural network and classical machine learning. And again, we are interested in applying at the end our approach in a quantum computer as a new field. So we are really combining those three fields, statistical physics, neural network, and quantum computing to discover what is the subspace in Hilbert space that's so important for us to consider. And when you go back to the restricted Boltzmann machine before I go through the details, it looks like it goes back to, in classical, I'm talking about classical restricted Boltzmann machines, it goes back to the 87, and I think there's one article in 2006 by Hinton. And before that, I think the first one to use it was Paul Smansky, and he's a computer scientist at John Hopkins. Okay, so what is the objective of this uh, quantum machine learning for us now? I mean, when you look at problem in quantum chemistry, I mean, we are lucky, we know the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is given, so you introduce a basis set. And what you have, you have a Hamiltonian matrix in the complex plane and with dimension D, so D by D. And all we have to struggle with is finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And we have this problem with us for like a hundred years now. <laughs> so what is the, our approach? I mean, first we'd like to construct a neural network to learn the required state for this system, construct a quantum circuit to train the network and then implement it on a quantum computer. So my talk uh, uh, based on three recent papers that we published, the first one was a natural communication about the uh, Boltzmann machine for simple molecular system. And then we extended to the valence band of 2D materials. And we have on the archive one getting not only the valence band, but both valence and conduction band. So we get also excited states. So if you would like to the details, I think you can go back and check the details of the, these public, three publications. And here are the students that really the hero or the one who did the work, I will mention later that like the specific contribution of each one, what was the postdoc of, uh, of us, Manas, uh, Sajan, and we are lucky he was a former PhD student with David Mazzotti, and he joined us a couple of months ago, hey, maybe six months ago now, and Shri from electrical computer engineering and Drongshan from physics. So it's good really to see the mix of students from physics engineering, the computer science working on these problems. Okay, so what our main contribution, or what to expect just in case if I run out of time and you did see the end of the, this talk. So I'm going to show you, or this is our contribution that we build a restricted Boltzmann machine with three layers. And I'll go through the details in a minute. Then we implemented on a quantum device. When we, I say implemented, we designed the quantum circuit with including the circuit width, depth, and the parameter count. And we show that this is a quadratic, where if you go the classical way of sampling, it's exponential. So this is what the advantage, maybe I will say it now, the advantage of our quantum uh, design is the quadratic resources used to sample the Gibbs distribution, where classically it's exponential. 
And here we can say, okay, you have to do a lot of measurement because this is a problem, you getting the probability of getting the, the system in a certain state. So what is about the sex, successful sampling? And we show that there is a lower bound for this one. We are not done yet, but at least we show there is an upper bound for successful sampling. And we implement it in 2D materials in addition to simple molecular systems. And when I say implemented both in the quantum simulator and on the real IBM machine. So this is the thing to expect from this lecture. So what is the restricted Boson machine? So here we have two layers, the visible layer and the hidden layer. So the visible layer, you have this biases or you can say local field. These are parameters to be trained, like a, the vector A1, which is component A1, A2, A3, depends how many nodes you will have in the visible. And then you have a hidden layer. Again, each node takes value one or minus one. And here we have the hidden node and you have the biases or local fields. And here you have the vector with M dimension. It depends how many nodes you will have in this hidden node. And these are connected by this matrix the weight matrix, which connect the visible with the hidden. And we call it restricted because there is no connection between the nodes within the layer. The connection only between layers, uh, visible and hidden. And just to give you the end of this story here, we go into sample the probability distribution out of the different configuration in the, uh, in the visible, I mean, here in the, in uh, this visible uh, layer. So the hidden layer is from the ASM you have hidden, but it's going to help us in optimizing parameter and tuning the system so you can get the probability distribution. So at the end of this first part, this part, we get the probability distribution. Again, it's a Boltzmann distribution. This is where the name comes in and it's E to the energy. And the energy here is given by Heisenberg type Hamiltonian. So you have the local field and the hidden field and then the interaction between the nodes in the visible and the hidden and normalized. So again, you can see we sum over all the state in the visible and hidden layer. And you have another phase here, which we call the phase node. And this is designed to get the phase of the wave function by allowing this to have a complex values. Here, all the parameters are real to get the distribution of the amplitude. Here are the complex part. And we have those two nodes. So at the end of the process, you get the wave function. So you get the wave function, the amplitude from sampling over the Boltzmann distribution. You have to take a square root. You have this one, which will give you the, no, the, the, the phase. And these are the configuration of the system in the visible layer. And this will give you the wave function from the quantum machine learning algorithm. So briefly, the algorithms, you start with initializing all the parameters. Here, the parameters is the local field and the visible, the hidden, the connection matrix the connectivity between the phase and the visible, all these parameters, you start at random, you run the calculations in like in any algorithm. And here, of course, the for the ground state, the cost function is minimizing the Hamiltonian with this wave function. So where is the quantum part? I will come back to the details. The quantum part is really how to sample the Gibbs distribution. The rest is classical. So this is where the hybrid comes in. So the quantum part is only sampling the Gibbs distribution and the rest done on a classical computer. And you combine the results in a hybrid algorithm. So more, let me just like to repeat for rotation. Anyway, I explained the, because here we have to map into a qubit. So in the, you have N, visible neuron, we have it to n visible qubit and in the hidden because now you have to map each a node into the qubit space. So let me describe the quantum uh, part of this algorithm because this is extremely important. 
So first we have the, let's say, take an example. In the visible node, we have two qubits. In the hidden, we have two. And then we add Ancela qubit, and you will see why we need to, the Ancela qubit. So first of all, you rotate your qubits, and this is the matrix for rotation. But remember, uh, look at this one. The, the parameters here is the local field. So you tune the rotation by, in, by putting the field again. I mean, you start with random, and then you have to iterate. So the rotation depends on the local field. Here, the rotation depends on the field, on the hidden layer. And once you do this, you take superposition of all possible configuration between visible and hidden. And this will give you the amplitude. And then the next is really to do the control, control, and you do a rotation here. And this is when you do control, control, you start introducing entanglement. And this is where you connect the visible and hidden layer with the, with the weight matrix. And we have a systematic way to encode the information from the uh, matrix of the connecting the hidden layer into the parameters in this rotation. And then you do the measurement. And once you do the measurement, we can get the wave function with the phase. So this is like a one iteration. And then you have to repeat this quantum circuit when you do the measurement. So this is the essential part of the quantum in the, on the computer. I will not go to the details, but we also show mathematically there is a lower bound on the successful sampling. So just like uh, to summarize before giving you a couple of uh, results, in this one, we have two qubits in the visible, two qubits in the hidden, and four in the ancilla. And we, the students here, run this calculation with the 30,000 iteration on the simulator and 500 on the IBM quantum device. And we show that this sampling is successful to reproduce the, the, the amplitude of these wave functions. So classically, already people in computer science show that this is an exponential problem if you go to classical algorithm of sampling. Where for us, it's a quadratic and the resources, it goes like M times N, where N is really the number of nodes in the hidden, in the visible and the hidden. So the first application was running this one by simple molecular system. And we show the results within chemical accuracy for this simple system that everyone run on a quantum computer these days with using like a, between four and six qubits. And the error was really within 10 to the minus three atomic units. And then we run the same quantum circuit uh, for two dimensional materials. And the same circuit, but now what is the, what is the really the, the addition here? And also, I mean, this paper by the Japanese group, they did the add the complexity into the, uh, the sign layer in order to include the boundary condition because in, in when you go to a two-D material and you have boundary condition, you, you go to Fourier, Fourier, you do Fourier transforming in order to include the, the, the boundary condition. And this is where, you need the complexity in this uh, sign layer in order to get the right phase and include boundary condition. So my student run it for with simple Hamiltonian with four by four matrices since the unit circle, including two atoms here for those two for the graphene and the hexagonal born nitride. And we use the tight binding Hamiltonian which fitted to more accurate DFT and other advancement method. But we took that Hamiltonian and we show how one can run it on a quantum computer by this method. And this done by Srihari. And he showed the results for boron nitride, excellent uh, comparing with the excellent results comparing with the, with the exact diagonalization. And we run it with Hubbard U equals zero and there is, no on-site interaction. And when we made Hubbard term 9.3, you see the split of the, of the valence band. 
and it's compared very well with the exact results. So again, here is the cost function that we're really trying to do is minimizing the Hamiltonian after you discover what is the configuration from the Boltzmann distribution. And then we took it one more step to go from the balance to the conduction band or getting the whole spectrum. And this is where the main contribution of manners to add another term and a penalty term, which allow you to project out the ground state. Once you find the ground state, you can form this operator as the projection from the ground state because the second one will be orthogonal. And then the if this is the projection of the ground state, this is, will be zero and lambda will be larger than the, the spectral range of the Hamiltonian. So as a penalty term will allow you to go to the excited state with the same method. So here we use this operator to be the front constructed from the ground state with omega zero and the parameter larger than the spectral or the, the norm of the Hamiltonian. So you can go to the excited state. And Manas was really able to go for valence and conduction band of this two dimensional again with a simple Hamiltonian that described this uh, system. And here's the Hamiltonian that we took. This was the from Physical Review B back in 2013. And they showed that this Hamiltonian can be constructed with three main orbitals of the metal dz square x, y, and x square minus y square. And for us, we have three qubit and we add one qubit. So the Hamiltonian, again, is a simple Hamiltonian. It's a four by four Hamiltonian matrix that we run with this quantum machine learning on a quantum computer. And he got really outstanding results when we saw the results between, uh, and we compare it with here, like when you say, we restrict the Boston machine in classical running like in a classical computer, just a linear algebra problem. And we run it on the CASM through IBM and on the real machine. And you see the results, the, the solid line is the exact one. And these are the different, different methods of calculation. And one, what, what we did here to really get the results on the real machine, we call what we call in machine learning a warm startup. So you start here, once you have convergence of the, of the results for the parameter space, you don't go back and run it randomly from the beginning. I mean, you start with this point and use the results of them, this, this point to go to the second one. So it's like a transfer way of, of the calculation between points. So you don't have to start from a random distribution. And you see that the error is really within 10 to the minus five uh, for both the valence and the conduction band and the infidelity, which means you compare the wave function with the exact one. It's really an excellent, uh, excellent comparing with the exact one. And he did it for this, again, for this material. And I think we have one, two minutes just I would like to summarize. We also, uh, show how this is just briefly how this method can also describe this simple quantum Rabi model where they have they show analytically Martin Peleno and physical review later and there was an experimental verification of this natural communication although this is a final system there is a quantum phase transition and we were able to do capture it by quantum machine learning so let me summarize what is the conclusion out of uh, this. I show you we have now the restricted Boltzmann machine with two layers visible and hidden and the phase for the phase function or the sign for the phase function with complex parameter. We can capture the, the electronic structure calculations with a quadratic uh, complexity sampling. And we can get in addition to the valence and conduction band quantum phase transition on a quantum computer. So still at the end, I would like really to emphasize this at that point. Did we really understand how the machine is working? Why this is working? My answer is still, we don't know why this is working as it's supposed to work and give this excellent results. And we still try to figure out the physics. And we met, since we go with the Boltzmann machine, we look at the Boltzmann distribution really to try to understand what the machine is doing. I mean, we know it's doing the right thing, but we don't really understand the physics. And with this, I will finish and finish my, I mean, thank my students that 
they were involved with this one, Manas, Sri, and Rongshen, and others also contributed, and funding from DOE for this project and NSF, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sabri. That was a great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? There's none in the chat, but if anyone wants to raise their hand now. I have a quick question for you, Sabri, while, while everyone else kind of thinks about it if they need to. Um, for Manas's work for the, the restricted bolton machine, mm -hmm. did you use any form of error mitigation on that data or uh, was that uh, just... Yeah. yeah, when we talk about the experimental results with the machine, this is including error mitigation. So okay, because say it looks it looks amazingly accurate. So yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, yeah, with the, with the quantum machine with uh, with the error with the, uh, let me just show you the yeah the experimental results here with error mitigation. Yes. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. David, you've got a question. Oh, Sabri, beautiful talk. Um, yeah, just following up on today's question about the error mitigation and so on. So. So it seems very robust to noise. So on a near intermediate scale, you know, quantum computer, are these algorithms then fairly robust to noise? And is there a way to understand that? Yeah, I think the way we analyze the noise, if I don't include the error mitigation, the results are all over the space. Okay. We, yeah, no, no, it's like the results are scattered. I mean, I have one to show the scatter, but I could not find it this morning. The results are not really good. I mean, scattered. And then you do error mitigation and it's not enough. You really have to start I mean, suppose you capture one at the K point that the results were good for on the machine. Then you use it to propagate to the second one. If we don't do this, also we don't get good results in the machine. So somehow, if you start with that, where you know the answer is really very accurate, you start from there and then you move to the second uh, in the K points. Otherwise, the results on the machine are not really. So I, I will not say really, really robust algorithms. So you have to do a few tricks. Uh -huh. But since we know, I mean, I mean, we, I mean, we can start with a point that we know the answer that the, the, the system is really giving us good results and go from there instead of random. Right, right. Because once sure. you start from random, you, then you scatter the results. And that makes sense too. Obviously, <clears throat> one wants to build the physics, as you said, from the beginning into the distribution and also into the guess. But yeah, yeah it's, I mean, the data is, uh, is fantastic, you know, for, for the quantum computer. It's uh, very accurate, it's great. Are there any other last questions before we switch speakers? Well, thank you, Sabri, so much. That was a fantastic talk. It was great to hear more about it. Yeah, thank you um, so much. Thanks. Of course. And our next speaker is Pruneha Narang from Harvard University.